very wonderful event overall. I attended most of the sessions. All the speakers were highly knowledgeable, articulate and solution oriented. And I feel honored to be standing here and speaking before all, you, all of you dignitaries. Um, so how do we know that, there we, that we are victims of information warfare or negative propaganda? How do we know it? So when celebrities like Greta Thunberg, Rihanna or Malala Yousafzai are given toolkits to tweet against us. When sellouts with no credible records are promoted as fact checkers or propped up as legitimate voices from India on foreign media like New York Times, Washington Post or Huff Post. When no one seems to be talking about the applaudable Amrit Kal budget, but everyone wants to talk about Amrit Pal Singh. When an antisocial element who threatens government employees or gives refuge to a terrorist or hides grenades in his bag is labeled as a journalist. When every criminal in our jail is labeled as a Muslim victim. Or when every unconvicted or falsely accused Hindu is not in jail and subsequently some Muslim is labeled as a victim. So we know that we are victims of information warfare and negative propaganda. So Islam has been weaponized since medieval times for political gains. Like the Abbasids used Islam in its early years as an ideological weapon to overthrow the Umayyad Caliphate. Subsequently, tyrant rulers from places like Persia, Turkey, Mongolia and Afghanistan invaded non-Muslim lands, including India, to loot their temples and resources, validating this plunder by stating that they're simply doing service to Allah by converting pagans into Muslims. Now, unlike Taimur or Sikandar Butshikan, the kinder Muslim invaders like Akbar did not commit a mass genocide of non-Muslims, but in fact allowed non-Muslims a right to live, condition if they paid a life tax called jazia. Note that both forceful conversion or forced taxes are forbidden in Islam. A religion which has faced heavy political weaponization for centuries, even in modern history, right from the Russian Revolution to Afghan and Syrian jihads. Also note that Islam is not only weaponized by Islamic radicals, but more so by other white collar members of the world order. Let's take a look at how this is done. So in the UK, the Labour Party and Conservatives have formed their own vote banks. While the Conservatives are more preferred by progressive Indian origin people living in the UK, the Labour Party panders to the whims of illusionists. I will not call them Islamists. Because Islam, in its true sense, it doesn't propagate fighting for material things like uh, political uh, power or land. The only fight permitted in Islam is a fight to worship Allah if a believer is being stopped from doing so, even after he has migrated to another place so he can worship Allah without offending anyone. Those are the rules to fighting in Islam. But these illusionists who are being appeased by the Labour Party of the United Kingdom rely on fabricated facts and figures to create unrest in the name of fighting for rights of the Kashmiri people living 4,000 miles away. So we all know the basic rule. The more unrest in an existing government's rule is directly proportional to votes in favor of the opposition. So the more unrest during the conservative government, chances of more votes in favor of the Labour Party. It's interesting to note that while there is no Berlin Council in the Tokyo Parliament or Australian Council in the Brazilian Parliament, but there's a Kashmir Council in the UK Parliament which disappointingly appoints speakers who have never lived in the Kashmir Valley but are natives of the Pakistan side of Kashmir. They are Dogra Muslims by ethnicity while at the same time being hostile to pleas of the original Kashmiri natives, the Kashmiri Pandits, who are victims of an exodus. Somehow the UK, which lent its judicial practice and codes of law to most of the Commonwealth countries, is trying to push this matter under the carpet because no laws or code of justice were ever made for victims of a mass exodus. So irony in a nutshell, Britain which has rejected independence referendums for Scotland and Wales recently, thereby illegally occupying these lands, is harboring elements who demand a referendum from Indian Kashmir while sitting in its parliament. Okay, so the Kashmir issue is not the only source of unrest that the Labour Party ensues, 
to create a narrative that the conservatives can't rule peacefully. Allowing goons to vandalize Hindu temples on the pretext of a cricket match result. Or by making harmless Hindu greeting Jai Shri Ram a war cry. Are some other ways to distribute native Indian Hindu Rishi Sunak's conservative government. The latest effort was a ridiculous documentary released by the BBC accusing Prime Minister Modi for what happened in Gujarat in 2002, for heaven's sake, 2002, when some of us were not even born, some of us were still in our teens, some of us just delivered babies, were graduates today, 2002. Possibly because it was impossible to find anything against Prime Minister Modi in more recent years, especially after Modi's BJP got a thumping victory in Gujarat of 2022, when even predominant Muslim areas of Gujarat, like Daryapur and East Surat, voted for Modi's BJP with a large mandate, one lakh plus votes. So, moving on to similar tactics across the Atlantic, when Ilhan Omar of the USA, of, of the American Congress, visits Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. So, instead of making a statement about the prevalent problems there, for example, degradation of women's rights to justice, wage shortages leading to mass riots, political suppression and chronic power cuts faced by the people of Pakistan side of Kashmir, Ilhan Omar instead makes a statement about the fabricated oppression of people in the Indian side of Kashmir. What does that lead to? Obviously more votes for American Congress from the Muslims, especially of Pakistani origin living in the USA. However, Point to be noted here is that it's not only Islam but other religions too that are being weaponized for selfish political interests by world leaders, making India the scapegoat. So latest example, the Canadian President Justin Trudeau looking to sweep votes from Canada's fourth largest majority, the Canadian Sikhs, by slamming India for farmers protests led by the Sikhs. And more recently, his one-sided condemnation of the Russian referendum in Ukraine but not against the Khalistan referendum in Canada selective condemnation. So we have to understand that India is home to a sizable population belong to, belonging to almost all religions of the world. And a sizable population of migrants around the world are from India. So within India, it is already a colossal challenge to maintain peace and harmony between diverse religions and cultures within a democratic framework and while ensuring that Indian sovereignty is not compromised. But it gets more difficult when international political interests are at play. So while the West continues to make India a scapegoat for its political interests, on the other side of the world, China is insecure of India's growing economic importance. Knowing fully well that India has every potential to beat China at its own game in the world, it ensures that unrest ensures in India, uh, ensues in India by aiding Pakistan in its proxy war. As an evidence, I can say that drones loaded with guns and ammunition are being sent inside Indian borders. Forensic analysis of these drones show that uh, show the evidence that these drones were flown in 2015 in China and then in 2017 in Khanawal district of Pakistan. What, what more evidence does the world need? Anyway, the strategy here is clear. The more resources India burns in curbing domestic unrest, the more it becomes it comes on an economic back foot. So while everyone from east to west continues to take advantage of any unrest in India, be it real unrest like the farmers protest or a fabricated unrest like the Kashmir conflict, when you ask these white collar members of the world order to find a solution to any unrest in India, they immediately, very conveniently, in fact almost reflexively place the task on the shoulders of the United Nations. So let's take, for example, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock's response during her Pakistan visit. She quoted, United Nations must take responsibility to maintain peace and order and human rights in Kashmir. It's not only her, we got to admit, many think that the United Nations will be knight in charming armor and come to the rescue of Kashmiris. But let me tell you, the United Nations office in Kashmir is a deserted monument. It's located in Srinagar, in an area called Sonwar. It's a deserted monument where no representative has come since 2010. So the same report about Kashmir which was made in 2010 or before is juxtaposed with the current date and submitted every year. 
to the United Nations. This is how misinformed the knight in, sh uh, knight in shining armor is. And it's not only misinformed, it's also malinformed with a one-sided bias. Because while on one hand a juxtaposed report is submitted every year from Indian Kashmir, from the Pakistan side of Kashmir, a local Pakistani news agency has been outsourced the task of providing fresh reports to the United Nations. Anyway, that's enough blaming others for our problems. Since some of you kind people have traveled so far, have come here to find solutions, some of you are here for policy making, I think it becomes imperative for us to introspect, look within ourselves and see what we Indians are doing wrong. What are we doing wrong in dealing with all this propaganda against our country, why we let it happen in the first place, and why we're still not quite there at countering it. Introspection. So we have some problems, DNA as you may call it. What such as that, we mind our business too much. We mind our business too much. So let's take for example, when US President Kamala Harris lectured us about how democracies should run. Easy for her to say, isn't it? With no rogue nations at any of America's borders. Do you know how many rogue nations we have at our borders? Easy for her to say, isn't it, how democracies work? With just one political opposition to deal with, just one, the Democrats. Do you know, I mean, sorry, the, the, the Republicans. Do you know how many political parties we have in India? Does anyone know? 2,858. And she tells us how to run democracy. And she says it, when the United States is going through banking sector failures, increasing interest rates, inflation, increasing poverty rate, currently at 11.6%, increasing income disparity, the, the highest ever recorded at 0.5% in the United States. But she said this about people in Kashmir living 7,000 miles away. We want to remind the Kashmiris that they are not alone in the world. We are keeping a track of the situation. Sure, it's like being nosy to a different level, but we appreciate the concern. But you will never see an Indian minister making a statement like that about the United States. You will never see an Indian minister saying something like, we want to remind the street, speaker, street sleepers of downtown Los Angeles that they are not alone in the world. We are keeping a track of the situation. If there is a need to intervene, we will intervene if the situation demands. You will never see an Indian minister saying that in media, because we mind our business too much. Another problem with us Indians is that we're too much into our own selves. Introspect. So our competitors in the field of information warfare go to many extents. For example, they even learn native Kashmiri language. So that they can abuse Indian Kashmiris, like myself, on social media and make us feel guilty about not supporting the freedom movement against India and make us feel that we're such bad Muslims. But we Indians, you ask us to learn an enemy language, uh, an enemy nation's language, which is a significant strategy, by the way, to influence and create narratives in an enemy nation. But you ask us to learn an enemy nation's language. For example, you ask us to learn how to read and write in Urdu. We just end up becoming fans of Urdu ghazals and Shairi. Then we join Shairi groups. We host some Shairi parties, we organize Shairi events, then we become Shires and finally give up on what we had set out to do. <laughs> you tell us, you tell Indians to learn the Chinese language. They'll just binge watch on Bruce Lee's movies with subtitles and then they'll end up learning some of his action moves but not his language. So see, we don't enjoy the task of learning an enemy nation's language. We're just too happy in our own world, our own language, our own movies, our own festivals. So the radicals engaged in creating and spreading anti-India content across various platforms, whether on social media or through unauthorized sermons in holy places, especially in mosques. They don't mind if you label them jihadis, terrorists, non-state actors as Pakistan calls them. But they stick to their notion that killing or rioting in the name of Islam is acceptable. And they stick together for and with their brotherhood or Ummah. But the regular Indians are so allergic to name calling. 
So when we Indians get time from inventing rockets at NASA or presiding over global corporations as CEOs, you know, and doing other such fancy things for which we don't get credit for. And when we try to exhibit a normal level of Indian nationalism, I won't say we because I don't come in this, reg I, I exhibit it openly, but the regular Indian, when he tries to exhibit a nominal level of Indian nationalism, he or she gets consequently faced with getting stereotyped and then he or she simply backs off. All that an enemy needs to say is, hey, why are you being so hyper-nationalist? Are you a bhakt? You sound like a bhakt. You, oh, you sangi. You wanna be Nazi. You Hindu to an agent. It gets worse for a Muslim Indian nationalist. Why are you supporting Modi's India, you loser? You Munafik, you Murtad, you sold your soul to the Jews, you Yahudi. And that's it. Indian brothers and sisters zip up their nationalism forever. And they don't speak after that. In fact, we have a wonderful government policy. No government employee is allowed to make any statement or opinion about the Indian government on social media. Wonderful state of affairs, isn't it? Considering that there is no credible private sector in Kashmir yet, and more than half of its workforce is employed in government departments. But you'll never hear them because they can't speak. The next problem, you already know that Islamic radicals even change the meaning of Quranic texts just to resist and fight, even if it is for an unjustified cause. But we Indians won't even care to read our dharmic texts about war tactics and strategies given in Hindu literature, like Chanakya Niti. In fact, we don't think we should be fighting for anything at all unless we are in Indian armed forces. So while democratic countries like Turkey and Singapore have mandatory military training, military conscription as we call it, somehow goes against principles of democracy in India. We fear that it may again lead to people protesting on the streets and bunch of nosy foreign politicians pointing fingers at us. So we won't introduce military conscription. The next problem with us, we will always remain defenders. We never attack. Vasudev Kutum and all that, you know. So UNSC members seem to keep reminding India not to be authoritarian. Yeah, sure, Indians and authoritarians. Unlike China, which identifies every place in the Far East as its own, where people have any physical resemblance to the Chinese. Even India's Arunachal Pradesh, China calls its own. It even, it tries every strategy in the book to include that place in its ambitious one China policy. But so-called authoritarian Indians are never found saying, oh, the people of Mauritius, the people of Mauritius are Hindu, so Mauritius is part of Bharat. You'll never see us saying, oh, the people of Guyana are Hindu. Hence, let's geopolitically encircle it, economically weaken it, even isolate it if need be, until it accepts that it's part of India. We'll never say that. The next problem is that we are so busy defending that we don't even realize the power of our own resources. Let's again take the example of German uh, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. If she says something nasty about India, even in a state of unpreparedness, as the Germans claim, then considering the total German population around the world, a maximum of about 80 million people will form a negative opinion about India. But now imagine, just imagine, considering how many Indians are there around the world, if Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar says something nasty about Germany, Something like, and therefore we support the work of G20 nations with the situation of mega transport strike in Germany, the worst ever in 30 years, to ensure that all transport workers' economic rights are being guaranteed. Just imagine if S.J. Shankarji says these words. How many people in the world are going to form a negative opinion of Germany? Consider how many Indians in the world and also how many Indian, how many hidden enemies or rivals Germany has? Denmark, Poland, Russia. I leave that to you to imagine. Uh, but I would like to request uh, any foreign delegates present here, please. Uh, I am a new entry in the world of diplomacy. I'm very raw. Please don't take offense with my words. Please take my words with a pinch of salt. I'm just speaking my mind out. 
And also don't worry, Indians mind their own business too much and they won't attack, they only defend. So I guess the propaganda will just keep continuing and keep growing against India. Another fault in us Indians, the last one that I'll name now. Another fault in us, in our DNA. We don't fall in the line. Oh no sir. So we end up making ourselves enemies, especially the big daddies. So the Indian stand in the Russia-Ukraine war is a relevant example. We support the women of Iran in their resistance against forceful hijab. Even if it strains our largely cordial relations with Iran, which is why the Iranian foreign minister cancelled his visit to India last month. We don't fall in the line. We won't give refuge to Rohingyas, even if it displeases the UN Refugee Convention, of which we are not signatories, by the way. We don't care to be bound by the principle of non refoulement We don't fall in the line. So I'm very hopeful that like China didn't fall in the line and didn't care much about the world order's opinion when it enforced national security laws in democratic Hong Kong. I don't think Indian policymakers are going to waste any more time in framing a stringent national security law criminalizing any act of succession, subversion, terrorism, or collusion with foreign uh, agencies or external agencies. The solutions to most of our problems lie within ourselves, and I hope that, like in most cases in history, India becomes self-sustaining in dealing with the increasing global anti-India propaganda. Thank you so much.